Welcome back to Partial Derivatives and Thermodynamics in Physical Chemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about a very important technique in solving a lot of problems in introductory uh, physical chemistry courses. And it's also useful in a lot of physics courses as well. And that's the technique of solving a separable ordinary differential equation. All right, so what is a differential equation to begin with? Well, a differential equation is an equation with a derivative in it, okay? So you probably have seen these before. Um, if you express some, um, like here, here's an example. If I take, if I look at the derivative of E with respect to T, that's actually power, but the derivative of say energy with respect to time, notice it's equal to apparently 4T squared plus 5T plus eight, all right? So in other words, I have in a way, I actually have this expression in terms of a derivative, okay? I could have this in terms of simply energy, but I have it in terms of the derivative of energy. And because it's in terms of a derivative, could be a first derivative, a second derivative, um, it's going to be a differential equation, okay? Another example, this is also a differential equation, but the difference here is that not only do I have the first derivative of y with respect to x, I also have the function y itself, okay? Um, and so this has the function itself and the function's derivative, but because it's in terms of a derivative, it's a differential equation, okay? This is another example. I could have the derivative of a with respect to t. It's apparently equal to a squared t to the fourth. Again, because I, ha I even though I have this a squared here, okay, that's the function squared, um, I do have the derivative of a, and because there's a derivative in it, it's a differential equation, okay? Differential equations um, can be very difficult to solve. I'll go ahead and just, I will, I will indicate that this first one is actually, a, it's a lot more difficult to solve, and they usually won't have you do that in physical chemistry because it requires a more complicated technique, although it's very doable. The type that you'll be focusing on in PCHEM are separable. Um, and that's because, when it, I mean separable, if there's one function A and it's in terms of T, when it's separable, it means I can get all the T expressions on one side and I can get all the A functions on, on the other side and then I can actually integrate both sides to determine the function itself, all right? So in the last video, one thing we talked about, and I'm not gonna go into heavy duty detail here, but if I have a function y, that's a, if, I, if y is a function of say x and t, okay, for example, the point in indicating this is that when I deal with derivatives, whether they're univariable or multivariable, in other words, partial derivatives, derivatives are very flexible, and they don't normally teach you this in a lot of courses, especially even the calculus courses, but if I have the derivative of y with respect to x, you can essentially treat this just like a fraction. For example, if I had the fraction four over five, four over five is equal to one over the reciprocal of four over five, which is five over four. These two things are equal. So if you imagine the four as like dy and five as dx, then dy dx is equal to one over its reciprocal. So one over dx over dy. So differentials, and certainly the dy is one differential, the dx is another differential. Differentials are very flexible. You can multiply them and divide them all over an expression, particularly a differential equation. The same is also true of partial derivatives. Okay, If I have the partial of y with respect to x at constant t, then that's equal to one over the partial of x with respect to y at constant t. Likewise, if I put this in terms of the other variable, partial of y with respect to t at constant x is one over the partial of t with respect to y at constant x. Whatever you're holding constant stays constant, and you just include in, in these things the reciprocal of the derivative, okay? One over that reciprocal. So the point is differentials are very, very flexible. They can be moved around all the time, okay? Now, before we actually get into the details of separable equations, I want to look at an analogy. Suppose I have this equation where it is a over b is equal to c plus d. Well, what I'm allowed to do, notice, is I'm allowed to multiply both sides by b, 
And you'll notice that that actually cancels the b over on this side. And I get that a is equal to c plus d quantity times b. I can even distribute the b. I can distribute the b to both terms here and get a is equal to bc plus bd. Right? And a is just sort of, you could think of it sort of just like a constant. Okay. Now what if I have a function or something like delta f? Suppose I have delta f over delta t is equal to g of t minus h of t. Well, I'm going to essentially treat this the same way. Okay, I'm allowed to, let's say, multiply both sides by delta t, as I've done here. That notice cancels the delta t here, and I would essentially get delta f is equal to g of t times delta t minus h of t times delta t. All right, so my expression is delta f equals g delta t minus h delta t. Now, what if for all of these changes, I set the limit of the change equal to zero? Well, that's going to take all of these, these, differ, or these changes and move them into infinitesimally small differentials. So if I have the limit, if I have the limit of delta going to zero of delta f over delta t, okay, the limit of all this, then the limit of all that is just the derivative of f with respect to t. All right, and that's when all the changes go to zero, essentially, or they approach zero. That becomes a differential, and the quotient of two differentials is just a derivative, a rate of change. So this expression right here, delta f equals g delta t minus h delta t, is actually completely analogous in differential form to df equals g of t dt minus h of t dt. Now, this is where this becomes really important, okay? What I'm allowed to do when I have differentials, and I've actually noticed, I've actually separated the variables, I have all the functions of t on the right side, all the functions of f on the left side, I'm allowed to actually integrate both sides, okay? One of the things you're used to hearing about is, oh, I can, uh, I can you know, add two to both sides. I can subtract 10 million from both sides. I can divide both sides by three, multiply both sides by 10. One of the things you're also allowed to do is you're allowed to differentiate both sides with respect to one variable. You're also allowed to generally integrate both sides. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that I'm going to integrate df from f1 to f2. I'm going to integrate this term from t1 to t2. And then I'm also going to integrate this term from t1 to t2. And my expression then becomes ultimately delta f because when you integrate a differential from initial to final, that becomes a delta. So delta f is equal to the integral from t1 to t2 of g of t dt minus the integral from t1 to t2 of h of t dt. And what I've essentially done here is I've actually solved a differential equation. Now I want to go back a little bit and do this a little more analytically. Okay, and I'm going to do it actually for some of the things that you're actually going to see in physical chemistry or in other aspects of physics. All right, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with the definition of heat capacity. And I'm actually going to do this for constant pressure systems. That's one of the things you'll see. So this is actually heat at constant pressure. So the heat capacity at constant pressure is equal to dq over dt. That's the definition. Okay. Now, heat capacity in general always technically is a function of temperatures. Now it is true that if you're over a small range of temperatures you can more or less say the heat capacity is constant, but in general heat capacity is a function of temperature, which means that I have Cp is actually Cp as a function of temperature. All right, so here I have this differential equation. Why is it a differential equation? I have a, der a derivative of heat with respect to time. That's a derivative. This over here heat capacity is a function all right, so I have a differential equation. So what I'm allowed to do is I'm allowed to multiply both sides by dt. Notice I've done that. dq over dt times dt is equal to cp times dt. Notice that will actually cancel the dt right there. And I ultimately get that dq right here is equal to cp, it's a function of temperature, cp of t times dt. So notice I have all the functions of q heat on one side. I have all the functions of temperature on one side. What that means is I have separated the equation, separated the differential equation. That's why it's called separable. 
I have all of one variable on one side and all of the other one on the other side. And when I do that, I'm allowed to integrate both sides. The left side, I'm gonna integrate from t1 to t2. So it's the integral from t1 to t2 of cp dt. That equals the integral of dq, and that's equal to q. So what we often say is the heat at constant pressure is equal to the integral from t1 to t2 of heat capacity at, at constant pressure as a function of temperature dt. This is actually the definition of heat when pressure is held constant. And that is your first differential equation. That's how, it, that's how they get this. It comes from a differential equation that dq over dt is the heat capacity. All right. Let's look at another one that's maybe a little more, bit, little bit more complicated. This is one that you're actually going to see in usually late uh, PCHEM one, sometimes in PCHEM two. This is in kinetics. All right. So when I see this a in brackets, that's a concentration. That so you know I'm dealing with kinetics. I'm saying the rate or the derivative of concentration of A with respect to T, usually we just say dA dt, is equal to minus Ka. So K is the rate constant, right? So right now, currently, I have one A on this side, the left side, that's the dA. I have the concentration of A on the right side. It's not currently separated, so I need to do some mathematical manipulations to separate everything, all right? And by the way, just for reference, I'm only saying this this rate only depends on one concentration, so this could be an example of an SN1 reaction. But anyways, that's not really important. Anyways, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by A to get all the A's on this side. When I divide both sides by A, I get 1 over A dA, right? And then I'm going to multiply both sides by dT. So essentially what I've done here is I've multiplied both sides by dT. I've divided both sides by concentration of A, right? And notice here that the dt's, those differentials, cancel. Concentration of A over concentration of A cancels. And that's where I get 1 over A dA is equal to minus K dt. Now notice I have all the t's on the right side, all the a's on the left side. I've separated the variables. I'm allowed to integrate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate 1 over A dA from A1 to A2. And then I'm going to integrate minus k dt from t1 to t2. And this is actually probably the, maybe the, this is perhaps the first time that you'll encounter an integrated rate law. You talked about integrated rate laws in probably general chemistry. This is actually how you get them. You start with the differential equation and then you integrate them as separable equations usually. And you get this natural log of a2 over a1 is equal to minus k delta t. And if t1 is 0, then it's just kt. All right, so, and sometimes they use a little bit of different notations for these rate laws, but you can manipulate this in different ways and you'll get the integrated rate law. This is the correct integrated rate law actually for a first order reaction, all right? All right, so that's another differential equation from kinetics, all right? So now what I would like to do is something that you are gonna see also in a later video. And that's once we've uh, had the derivation of two constants called beta and kappa. I'm only going to do one that involves kappa in this uh, video. Now essentially what I have here, okay, is a very important expression. The expression is as follows, okay. The expression is the partial derivative of p with respect to v at constant t is equal to minus 1 over kappa v. This is not a k, this is a kappa, Greek letter kappa. Negative 1 over kappa v, okay. Whatever I bracketed, that's what's originally there. Now notice, the derivative, it's a differential equation, but this is actually a partial differential equation. However, partial differential equations are usually um, just as simple to solve as ordinary differential equations. Ordinary differential equations are only univariable. When I have a partial differential equation, notice I have here in the denominator, I have, let's see, I have a, a dv. I'm still actually allowed to multiply both sides by that differential, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to multiply both sides. I'm gonna multiply this times dv and multiply this side times dv. That's what I've done here. Now notice the, the differential v here in the denominator. Even though it's a partial, I'm allowed to cancel it with this dv. Why is that? Well. If I look at this partial derivative, it's partial of p with respect to t at con or excuse me, partial derivative of p with respect to v at constant t. So I'm holding temperature constant, okay? 
Um, there's nowhere in this expression that I, ex I explicitly have um, temperature. Okay, I'm just assuming it is constant and that this is not in terms of temperature. So I'm allowed to essentially say this is dp dv. And that allows me to multiply by dv and cancel them. So what I ultimately get is dp is equal to minus 1 over kappa times 1 over v dv. Now, notice kappa is a constant. I have all the v's on the right side, all the p's on the left side. I'm allowed to integrate. If I integrate a differential from p1 to p2, that's going to be delta p. Negative 1 over kappa times the integral of 1 over v dv, we know is the natural log of v2 over v1. And I actually just, ex I just determined or actually derived an expression to calculate a change in pressure. Okay, this is a change in pressure. So in other words, um, you could actually calculate a change in pressure using other, other methods. For instance, I could just do the ideal gas equation twice, solve for P1, then solve for P2, then subtract them. Or I could just, I could just use this. Delta P is equal to negative 1 over kappa, ln of V2 over V1. The only thing I would have to worry about there is I'd have to know kappa, but kappa is a constant. So I can look it up in a table in the back of a PCHEM textbook, or there's thermodynamic databases online that have these tabulated at different temperatures. Okay, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of understanding on how to use differential equations, in particular separable equations, to solve um, some of these um, PCHEM type of problems. The only other thing I'll mention about differential equations is they're kind of an unsatisfying um, group of equations because it turns out in real life there are tons of these things that are ultimately derived from different data, but it turns out that only about 1% of them are actually, you're able, only 1% of them you can solve by hand. Um, they have developed all sorts of computers to calculate um, the solutions to differential equations or approximate them because by hand they are completely unsolvable. So about 99% of the time you actually end up plugging it into a computer anyways. An example of such an equation are that you'll do this in quantum mechanics when you do the Schrodinger equation. When you want to solve these for big atoms, so not hydrogen, but as you start to get bigger and bigger and bigger, Schrodinger equation is a second order differential equation, which means it has a second derivative in it. And solving that for multi-electron atoms, so things like helium and larger, it becomes very, very complicated and impossible to do by hand. So they have computers to do that stuff. Separable equations are the simplest to do. And fortunately, in most cases that you're going to encounter, almost everything can be solved through a, a separable equation. There's a few other derivations that you'll do or you may not do, depending. Um, one of them's in kinetics for some of the um, for some of the calculations for integrated rate laws that you can't actually use separable equations. There's another technique that you have to use, and it's actually the one that actually solves this one up here. Um, that one's a little more complicated, but still very doable. All right. So hopefully this gave you a little bit of intuition on what a separable equation is. Remember, differentials are flexible. You can multiply both sides by a differential and then integrate both sides as long as the variables are separated. So thanks for watching this video. See you in the next video.